didn't think I had that that way. <laughs> so you're gonna fall asleep? All right. I'll just freeze with a smile. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us via Zoom today. We are going to be talking about the offices of the deans and how students can utilize them. But first, before we get started, I'd like to ask everybody to keep their microphones on mute. The session is being recorded for future viewers and we would like to limit as extra noise as much as possible. So any questions you have, you can submit them via the chat feature and we will answer them later in the session. My name is Emma Consoli. I'm a senior here at Hobart Williams Smith. I'm from Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm an international relations major and I'm triple minoring in women's studies, public policy and writing colleagues. On campus, I do quite a bit. I'm a writing fellow. I work in the William Smith Dean's office. I work for the Office of Admissions. Um, I'm a part of the Laurel Society, which is William Smith's sophomore and junior honor society. I'm a part of Hi TMI, which is William Smith's senior honor society. And I'm the senior chapter leader of a club on campus called PLEN. PLEN stands for the Public Leadership Education Network, and it's a national organization based in DC, which is dedicated to promoting women in the field of public policy. On campus, though, we mostly do community building and uh, professional development. Uh, PLEN is actually also how I got involved with the William Smith Dean's office. Uh, when I came to campus uh, in the fall of 2016, I was a member of the William Smith lacrosse team, an aspiring biology major, and I had plans to go to medical school. But as you can see, I'm not majoring in bio. I have no plans to go to medical school. And um, I left the lacrosse team in the fall of my sophomore year. So when I left the lacrosse team, I was looking for a new community. PLEN became that community for me and that's how I got in touch with the William Smith Dean's office, since that uh, the Dean's office is like the parent of PLEN. Uh, so I'm here today with Assistant Deans Kelly Payne and Joe Mink. They will be closely tied to your class during your time at HWS, uh, but they're especially valuable during your transition into college life as a first year. So to kick things off, could one of you tell us a little bit more about the start of each student's relationship with their first year Dean? Yes, I can get things started. Thank you, Emma. I think Emma's story and, and the transformation of her uh, career is a good um, example of how working with the Dean's Office can really enliven and enrich a student's experience. I've been with the, Dean's, the William Smith Dean's Office since uh, 2018, and prior to that, um, I was working in, for um, well over a decade in higher education in various um, lecture, faculty, and advisory roles. Um, so working with students is really the hallmark of my professional experience, and that started for me um, as a college student when I really um, transitioned from, similarly to Emma, ironically, a, a biology major to an English major and really embraced the humanities um, by working closely with faculty and, and faculty advisors and my dean. So um, I am new to the colleges, but not new to higher education, and, and I've learned a lot working with students here about just how uh, much this community embraces student stories and student experiences and the dean's office and our work with you is certainly an important part of that uh, i myself am a first generation college student and the first in my immediate and extended family to earn a phd uh, my degree is in english literature and really story is uh, kind of how i base my interactions with students your story matters and we begin to get to know each other um, even before orientation as the deans are, are reading about you and about your intellectual and academic interests through the um, academic preference form that um, sometime around uh, early May you'll receive and uh, access to and start to fill out. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. But some things you should know about your dean is that we will introduce ourselves and, and let you get to know us and we want to get to know you. So. Um, I uh, am a mother as well as a dean. I have an eight-year-old son, Francis. Dean Mink knows him well, as does Emma. Um, he is around a lot, um, which is true of a lot of uh, faculty and staff that you know we consider the campus community a kind of extension in some ways of our family. Um, some have described my son as the, the mascot of my classes. Um, we are class deans, so we will stay with you from your first semester and first year through graduation, which is great, so our getting to know each other happens over time and, and is really a genuine relationship. Um, my son said it was important to share with you three things about myself. And Dean Mink may, may chuckle at some of this. So one, he said, I'm, I'm an optimistic person. And I certainly um, have 
uh, that sense of hope when I'm working with students. And I know that college is uh, a learning experience and it can be challenging, but there are also some hardships and, and um, pitfalls that sometimes happen. And so your deans are there with you from orientation on to help you through that. So my optimism is something I'm smiling a lot, giving a lot of high fives. It's just part of how I work. I also share with Dean Mink a love of coffee and he and I will encounter students along the way most mornings as we're walking to AVP to, um, in the library to get our, our coffee fill for the day. And we use that time to to see students in their element as they're studying and going to class. Um, and I'm also a person who really likes to get to know other people. So those, that, that's the way that I start to get to know students is just by learning from you what your story is through the academic preference form and orientation. And then from there, we'll continue to know each other through your senior year. Dean Mink, do you wanna share a bit about yourself? Okay. Uh, my name's Joe Mink. I uh, have been at the colleges for eight years, maybe nine years. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I've lost count. Uh, I uh, actually have been in higher education for 20 years, previous to being an assistant dean, which I began at the same time that Dean Payne did. Uh, so this is our second year. I taught for 18 years at different uh, liberal arts colleges, uh, Bryn Mawr College, Mount Holyoke, New College of Florida. Uh, my PhD is in political science. And uh, actually I study kind of philosophy and history. So I don't know if political science would claim me most of the time. Uh, my first research project was on temperance, but I was less interested in the movement and more interested in the idea of moderation and how in the 19th century, uh, given the kind of newfound freedoms that uh, individuals were experiencing privately and politically, how you would make them safer in their reasoning. Uh, currently, I'm researching cities as a form of citizenship. Uh, I had a pretty serious transformation in my own life, somewhat like Emma. Uh, I began college and transitioned very, very, very badly. Uh, uh, unlike Emma, <laughs> I ended up flunking out of college for several years. And so when I came back, I was really dedicated to the kind of transformation that you can have uh, in college. And so one of the things that I've done my entire career is work pretty much extensively with first year students, uh, doing either first year seminars or introductory courses in political science and American studies. Uh, I'm not sure I have three things I can tell you about myself. Uh, uh, the one thing you'll get to understand if, if you spend time uh, talking with me is that I have a very strange sense of humor. Uh, my primary attachment is to a cat, which can't possibly be good. And uh, I really care about helping students make that transition. Uh, when I started college, I was kind of a combination of, um, I wanted to play baseball, but I was really bad at it. I wanted to do really well in college, but I wasn't used to the kind of freedom that you get in your first couple of years to be able to set your own schedule. And I came from a family that, to be quite honest, didn't have the financial means or the cultural capital to do really well in college. And so as a result, I kind of didn't take advantage of the kind of support that the school I was attending had. And so that's one of the things that I try to do as Dean is to make sure that students are able to make that transition and so that they can experience a, the kind of transformation into whatever it is that they will and want to become. Okay, so um, one of the exciting things about the summer before I came to HWS was receiving my course list and trying to decide which classes that I wanted to take in the fall. I know, Dean Payne, you touched briefly on the academic preference form, but would both of you explain how students receive their academic schedules for the fall semester? Yeah, things started, sure. Um, so as I said, we get to know students, all of you, um, first by how you write about yourselves in the academic preference form and being really intentional and thoughtful and honest um, as you're filling that out is really important. So we get to know some of your interests, what you're looking forward to doing at the colleges, what different academic departments you already have interest in. Um, there's no pressure for students at Hobart and William Smith colleges to declare majors until 
their sophomore year. So there's a lot of time for curiosity and exploration. And so we need to hear from you in that academic preference form about what your academic and intellectual background has been um, through your high school um, and secondary experiences. And then also what you're forecasting for yourself, what you're looking forward to, areas that you're open to. You know, we'll have students tell us if they wanna study abroad, um, if they're thinking already of um, one of the particular disciplines or branches of knowledge through the humanities, social sciences, or natural sciences. And really what we want to hear from you within that preference form to get to know you um, is what are you interested in learning about? Because of course, um, there's a, a lot that happens in college. It is uh, about the residential and social experience and how your character develops. Um, but in terms of how you work with your dean and the ultimate goal of college, which is to earn your degree, it's about your learning and, and learning in the broadest and deepest sense of what that word means. Um, so we want to hear from you about what, uh, what learning you're, you're wanting to do in college. So the academic preference form is really, really key. And as I said, being thoughtful and intentional as you're filling that out is really helpful. And that becomes, um, that's in the orientation portal and you, in early May, um, students will have access to filling that out. Dean Ming, do you want to say a bit more about how we work with students in that form to register? Uh, the two things that I want to stress uh, in particular uh, build upon what Dean Payne said about the academic preference form. There's, and this is going to be the detail part, and then I'll talk a little bit more generally. In terms of detail, the two sections that I would ask you to spend some care in filling out is the section that talks about your previous learning experiences. And so not only the kind of topics that you were interested in or the classes that you enjoyed in high school, but maybe a little bit about how you feel that you are best in terms of learning. Uh, one of the things that students often do is because college is so aspirational, you're, you're coming to try to have a particular sort of career or future life, is that a lot of times we'll get students who say, I want to go into economics or I want to go into business, and they don't tell us much about kind of their previous interests, and they don't tell us kind of broadly about their interests. And it's... Uh, I think so many people begin college with one idea of what they're going to become and they end up with a completely different major that it's helpful to know the kinds of broader topics that you're interested in. Uh, and the second really small detail part is that at uh, one part in terms of the academic preference is that you're gonna be asked to kind of list classes you're interested in and you're gonna be asked to list first year seminars that you're listed, you're interested in. But immediately after that, there's a question that allows you to give some sort of order to your preferences. That's a really significant section because sometimes students will list eight or nine first year seminars that they're interested in, but they have really specific ones that they care about. And if they tell us that and they tell us why, that we learn something about them. Because that's one of the most important classes you're going to get is that first year seminar. Uh, and this is going to be then about the registration is that we're going to, as your deans, select your first two classes. And one of those is going to be that first year seminar. And these are, um, they're often associated with the discipline, but they try to be broader than that. I always think of them as being kind of pre-disciplinary. So not even interdisciplinary, but they're kind of teaching you the critical thinking skills that you're going to need for college. Uh, and then the second class is we try to make sure that you have something that you are genuinely interested in. Your final two classes you will select when you come to campus and start working with your academic advisor, who will be your first year seminar instructor. I just want to say a couple additional things. I think what Deming shared is, is really important. And to build on that, um, as you're filling out the academic preference form, think of it less as a form that you just need to finish and more as, an, as the first opportunity to introduce yourself to your dean and the first opportunity for you to share a bit of your intellectual journey and your story. So the more detail, the more we know about you and can schedule you within those first two classes. And as Dean Ming said, the first year seminar is a really integral and crucial course for your first semester. Those are small classes, usually around 15 students, and the professor who teaches your first uh, 
first year seminar is also your academic faculty advisor until you declare a major. So that person and, and their interests and the, the attention that they will pay to you is really um, important that it's a good match. So um, please do read through the descriptions carefully, take some time in filling out that form. Emma, I don't know if you, if you wanna speak to what that was like in your experience as you were doing, doing the preference form and preparing for your first semester. Yeah, so um, when I came to campus four years ago, um, the, the way that you registered for classes was a little bit different. Um, we had the academic preference form, um, and I took a lot of care and time in filling that out, but I didn't do what Dean Mink suggested and think about the broader aspects of why I wanted to major in biology. I thought that I knew that I wanted to major in biology. I had just gone through a major surgery. I tore my ACL, and so I was doing a lot with medicine and physical therapy, and I was really wrapped up in it. And I was really interested by it but my interest was less in the physical medicine part of it and more in the caring and the helping of others. So I didn't think about that um, element. So I, when I filled out my preference form, I thought I needed to get some hard sciences out of the way. So I listed, you know, chem, bio, physics, like all those introductory hard sciences classes that I needed to get out of the way so I could start making some headway into my requirements. But I did take a lot of care when thinking about my first year seminar. Um, and I ended up in a seminar um, with a women's studies professor um, as my advisor, and it was life changing. Um, that seminar is definitely the reason why I decided to move away from the sciences. I really, really loved that seminar. Um, that seminar had a connected class to it. So certain first year seminars will have a secondary class that go with it. Um, for me, that class was LGBT Studies 101, um, and that class was really eye-opening and really exciting for me. And I loved doing the work for those two classes, but absolutely despised doing my labs for chem. And I liked bio enough, but I didn't like it enough to stay with it, um, especially when I loved my other two classes more. So I would definitely reiterate, like, think about the larger themes of why you like certain things and certain disciplines. Um, because I found my avenue for helping people now through international relations and development. Um, but can you talk maybe a little bit about the process for the students choosing their second remaining courses? Because when I was a student, the deans picked all four courses. So um, can you talk a little bit about how students, the deans will put the students in their first year seminar and an additional class, and then you will pick the next two. But can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so at orientation, um, students will have advising sessions with their um, FSM professor, who will again be their faculty advisor until they declare a major. And you will determine kind of, um, you will get some guidance uh, in working with your faculty advisor around the other two classes. And then there'll be a separate um, session in which you will be in a room together with your FSM um, peers and with your FSM professor to actually register for the other two classes. So it's not as though we do the first uh, two classes and, and help you get started and you finish on your own. There's guidance and support every step of the way. Um, but the goal is that by the end of orientation, you both have a full schedule and one that really will um, set the foundation for your learning uh, at the colleges, but also that you will know the steps and the resources and the, and the kind of physical um, digital process that we use for registration to set you up and prepare you for in the fall and October when we have our early registration for spring. So it's meant to be a learning opportunity, one for self-exploration certainly, but also one where you get guidance on what the registration process looks like and how you can identify classes to meet requirements working with your faculty um, advisor and with your dean. And two things again that you should think about in terms of that is that one thing that will happen is that sometime early in August, your first year seminar instructor will contact you. And oftentimes they'll introduce not only themselves, but they'll ask you in the same way that Dean Payne and I have been suggesting that you introduce yourselves to them. And so in some sense, the advising will begin weeks before you actually come to orientation as you and your advisor get to know each other. Uh, and again, this is one of those opportunities you'll have to have uh, to be able to tell your story in a broader perspective than just I want to take 
this media and society class and this psychology class, it will help you, I think, if nothing else, learn something about yourself that you're telling these stories uh, to your uh, first year seminar instructor. Uh, and then the second thing is one of the reasons that I'm really excited about students getting to choose those final two classes is one of the big transitions that happens in college that Dean Payne and I will talk about a lot when we meet you is that this is going to be your journey. And so one of the things you end up doing is you kind of take ownership over your academic career. And by, by learning not only the process for selecting classes, but by working with your advisor to make a couple of selections. And, and to be honest, you're going to have to make five or six or seven because you may not get your first choice. But in that sense, you begin to understand that this is your journey and not just uh, an extension of high school. That this is going to be different because we're going to ask you to take responsibility and to be honest, to write your own story about what you want to become. I've heard it described that one of the goals of college is not just the networking and the credentialing to prepare you for the rest of your life, but the focus really is on that broader sense of learning and getting to the point where being in your own head is an interesting way to spend your time, that you become the person and you have the, the experiences to afford you to explore the identities that maybe you didn't have a chance to in high school and your interest in be, being a really curious person about the world and about yourself and about the communities in which you live. So the aspirational goal courses that you're gonna talk about with your faculty advisor and with us as your deans and just planning your overall um, academic journey as Dean Mink described it is really a way that we get to know you. And you know, if you can think of the deans as kind of the, the uh, central um, supports in your experience. We help students with, um, you know, the academic planning certainly, but also, and perhaps even more importantly, kind of visioning what your experience here can be like, how your involvements and how your courses and how your major and minor trajectories all kind of come together in a way to support who you want to become and then where you're gonna take that. So we're, we do a lot of visioning and a lot of connecting um, with students. And um, in some ways, you know, our work closely with your faculty advisors and with your faculty um, in your classes is another extension of how we will get to know you and help you along as you, as you proceed with your journey. Okay, so we've talked a lot about orientation and I know that you all work behind the scenes all summer to make sure that you know students, but my first physical interaction with the deans was at orientation um, when my twin sister and I arrived on campus. Um, the first, some of the first people that we met were the William Smith deans. Um, so can both of you briefly explain your involvement at orientation? My son calls it the festival of handshakes. <laughs> We are physically present um, with smiles and, and really ready to welcome you into the academic community of Hobart William Smith Colleges. And um, both, you know, the William Smith, my colleagues in the William Smith Dean's office and then our Hobart colleagues, including Dean Meek, come together to welcome you. We shake every hand. We get to know you a bit and your families or your guests, the people you bring to orientation to support you. It's really an enlivening um, event. And so um, when I say festival, it does certainly have that kind of energy. Um, it's your first uh, time to see us in person, to encounter us and your faculty and, and the whole of the academic community. You'll, President Jacobson will be there, Provost Coffee will be there, um, we'll be there to welcome you kind of en masse and it, it's a really fun event. And uh, for me the, the part that I'm always most uh, intrigued isn't the right word but kind of the, the part of the celebration that I find really significant is on the last day, because in the last day, uh, when you first get here, uh, you meet the president, you meet deans, and you sign the matriculation book, which officially starts your college career. And I always tell students that now I own your soul for the next four years. <laughs> but um, the actual matriculation ceremony takes place on Sunday. And one of the things that, that we have done recently, which I thought was really part of the celebration, is that we have actually, in, in the Hobart Dean's office, the deans have kind of taken a little bit of a step back from the ceremony. And the ceremony now involves 
uh, not only the first year students, but a large number of alums from the school. And I kind of always introduce them as just older students that they really haven't left Hobart. And, and the idea is because ideally a liberal arts education gives you that kind of curiosity that you will take into the world with you and that it never really goes away. And so last year we have this kind of group picture of uh, first year students and alums that some of them were, you know, 70 years old, um, all together uh, in front of Cox Hall. And that part of the celebration is something that I've always been particularly uh, uh, drawn to, uh, in part because you're becoming part of a community that's going to last, hopefully, for generations. And that you'll be part of the community and you'll be connected to people that you've never met just by being a member of Hobart and William Smith Colleges. There's also, and Emma, I don't know if you remember this, but um, similar to the experience Dean Mink is describing, toward the end of orientation, the William Smith Deans and the alumni, uh, the William Smith uh, Alumni Association and, and a lot of alums gather on the hill, the William Smith Hill. And there's a, a beautiful um, bronze sculpture that Professor Ted Aub, um created for the, the centennial um, of uh, the founding of William Smith College. And um, we gather, um, some words are said, some stories are shared, but it's about students and alums and um, uh, experienced students, our seniors and juniors kind of coming together and welcoming um, our new students to campus. And there's a moment when we walk, we proceed down the hill um, and uh, there's a lot of clapping and, and celebration to be sure, but it's meant to be momentous as a, as a mark of new students entering the William Smith community and the college's uh, community. And it, it's a powerful moment. So the deans will encounter students throughout orientation. And that's meant to symbolize kind of our continued uh, relationship with you through graduation and beyond. Um, but it's powerful to see our current students and our alums gathered there to welcome you as well. Yes, absolutely. I definitely remember those moments during orientation with alums coming back. It was really powerful and it made me feel um, like a welcome member of the community right from my, my first start on campus. Um, so it, in addition to the welcome events at orientation, I think that the deans are most visible during events like Founders Day or Moving Up Day or other academic excellence celebrations. So will you tell us a little bit about some of the events that you sponsor throughout the year? Dean Ming, do you want to get us started with some Hobart events? Uh, a couple of the things that we do, one of the things that we weren't able to do this year because of the social distancing, but I was really looking forward to was that uh, we were going to have a William Smith and Hobart celebratory dinner for students who had, who were being honored for a particular reason altogether as kind of one big celebration. And uh, uh, we're calling it the Blackwell Hell Dinner, I believe, but um, hopefully we'll be able to do that uh, beginning next year. Uh, we do have um, a, a celebration of the founding of the school charter day that uh, kind of in the, in the past, the celebration, I think, was largely about looking back to that founding. But one of the things that I think has been really great over the last few years is that uh, the students have in many ways uh, begin to alter the, the kind of traditions and ceremonies to try to make it so that the, the Founders Day is simultaneously uh, a celebration of the past, but more importantly about the aspirations of where the school wants to go in the future. And, and one of the things we've been doing around that um, has been to uh, create kind of new traditions. And as a student, you'd be able to, to participate in that, to not only kind of think about where the, the colleges have come from, but what you want them to be in 15 or 20 years. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the past, uh, one of the things that we've done is we've provided students uh, when they were leaving the college uh, with an oar. That kind of symbolizes that, that idea that I talked about before about taking ownership, because an oar in a canoe requires you to, to be able to set your direction and to have the skills to be able to maneuver it. And, uh, and, and so all of our things are kind of always thinking about that bigger picture of what your education should mean. On the uh, 
William Smith uh, College side, uh, we certainly uh, celebrate students along the way. There's a concept in uh, developmental education called lateral learning, where it, the focus is on peer-to-peer -peer exchange. And I think in all of our events, we try to make sure that our students' voices are um, present and foregrounded and emphasized in everything that we do. So um, we have uh, fall celebrations like our Dean's Welcome um, at the end of orientation that I was just talking about, and then also Founders Day um, to mark the um, late fall um, founding at the, at the turn of the 20th century when um, William Smith, who was a local nurseryman and involved in um, different agricultural um, enterprises, connected with uh, all of the um, women's rights uh, discourse and activism that was happening around uh, women getting the right to vote and the kind of um, end of the 19th century move toward uh, women's uh, liberation in the United States. And so impressed uh, as he was with his peers who were um, suffragettes, uh, William Smith devoted um, the financial resources to starting William Smith College, which was meant uh, to be uh, a kind of partner in the educational experience with Hobart College and to give women an opportunity to uh, move forward with their education and with liberal arts um, as its focus. So we do celebrate William Smith's founding of William Smith College and we do also celebrate students through the founding. So usually that's an opportunity where we bring an alum uh, an alumna to return to the campus and to talk and share their story, but our current student stories are also always present in those events, which makes them really um, powerful. In the spring, we have Celebrating Excellence, and I'll let Emma maybe share a little bit about her experience of, of those events, and then we also have a Moving Up Day um, in the spring that uh, helps to celebrate student accomplishments, but again, from that lateral learning, the peer-to-peer -peer perspective. So we try to always hold up women's stories and our students' stories and the experiences that um, William Smith uh, students and alums have had over time. Emma, do you want to say a bit about Celebrating Excellence this year? Sure. So uh, Celebrating Excellence is a campus-wide dinner um, which honors William Smith students for their academic achievement throughout the year. Um, and it also provides an opportunity to induct the new class of Laurel Society members. So as I mentioned, Earlier, I'm a member of the Laurel Society. It is William Smith College's sophomore and junior honor society. So that dinner happens in late February um, and students come for a really nice dinner. They hear speeches from peers. Um, generally, there's a first year speaker um, who talks about her experience um, and a senior speaker. So I was actually the senior speaker this year. So I talked about my experience um, here at the colleges and the ways that I've grown um, and then that event, during that event, they induct um, the new class of laurels. So it's really just a big campus-wide, really good food dinner uh, to, to take a moment to celebrate the incredible things that um, William, Smith, William Smith students and, and women have done on this campus academically. Um, in the spring, later in the spring, uh, we have Moving Up Day, which is where um, we celebrate the the moving up into the next class year um, so it's a really ceremonial event um, hi to me i which is the senior honor society helps to plan that event so echoing back to what dean mink said about being a part of the planning of those events um, hi to me i works to make sure that that event is um, keeping with some of the traditions but also um, pushing the envelope forward and pushing the event forward into um, our day and age, our generation. So we're not going to get to have moving up day in the way that we normally would, but um, us as a high team EI class are still working to do something virtually and making sure that we're being cognizant and being aware of where the ca college campus is now versus where it was um, in the found during the founding. Um, but I want to make sure that, oh, I I make sure that we have enough time to get to some of our last questions. Um, and I think it's important, while you're visible at some of these bigger events, I think it's important for people to understand how you all support students on a daily basis. So whether that means meeting with students to discuss challenges that they're facing, providing academic guidance, or connecting them to resources across campus, the Dean's Office is very student-centered. 
Um, so will both of you exp expand briefly on the ways in which your offices can support students? Absolutely. Um, and I'll just add, you know, that in terms of uh, student events and us being present, we will also attend events that students invite us to. So we host in the dean's office certain annual events um, that are traditions, but we are also there to be in support of you in a number of ways. So if you invite us to something, we will we will do our best to, to attend and to celebrate you. In terms of individual meetings with students, the dean's offices are open year round. So we do have some periods where the campus is shut down and obviously then we'll be working remotely, um, but our doors are open to help students with any number of um, questions, um, stages of planning, visioning, um, and then also you know any kind of uh, challenges that students have, we, we help you through. And we don't work by ourselves, so we work together as part of a community. We meet with students individually, of course, and um, learn a lot about, about you and what you need and what will be helpful. Um, the kind of phrase that I think is so powerful is that the dean's offices help students understand their options moving forward. And so to do that and really know what your options are comprehensively, we work together with your faculty, with the provost office, um, with resources like the Center for Teaching and Learning, with residential education. Um, we really work comprehensively to make options possible for you. Dean Mink, do you want to say a bit about well, how you and, it, and, and I think that the really important thing is that on a daily basis, we're also there for your entire academic career, if that makes sense. I mean, if you looked at my schedule today, I'm going to talk with a student that has been struggling a little bit with remote learning. They've always been a really good student, but this is a different environment uh, given what's going on. And so uh, they haven't felt as engaged. And so I'm going to, to help them uh, with some strategies for that. Later in the day, I'm working with a senior who is looking for options about how uh, to finish uh, this semester. Um, and later in the day, I'm uh, writing a letter of recommendation for one of my favorite students because they are uh, hopefully going to be able to uh, enter into medical school. And so kind of at all the stages of a student's life uh, on a day to day basis, we're there to help them figure out their options and to kind of maintain their focus on on being successful in college. And like I said, personally, that was something I had to learn. I didn't arrive at college with this kind of like perfect trajectory. And so uh, helping students make that transition and, and finding their own kind of path is what we do and we do it every day, not just at Founders Day or orientation. I'll just add that, you know, sometimes students won't know the necessarily the question that needs to be asked in a moment and um, sometimes students will think that to come to the dean's office is like going to the principal's office that there needs to be a problem or an issue and i will say that dean mink and i like to get to know students all of our colleagues like to get to know students and we're here even if you don't know what the question is we will help you um, so really just reaching out and getting to know your dean is a really important um, way to be successful in college Okay, so before we take questions from the audience, um, my last question for each of you is what advice do you have for new students as they prepare for their first semester of college, whether it be here at HWS or anywhere? Well, we hope to see all of you um, in the fall and to work with you closely and get to know you, but um, the biggest piece of advice that I would have for any student embarking on their college experience is to read read as widely read as as often as you can reading as a skill and as a way intellectually of, of approaching experiences um, is really uh, integral to your success and not just reading to skim or to get through pages or to check something off your to-do list but really reading with a sense of questioning um, what you're doing and with a critical eye and but, you know, thinking of the, the works that you're reading, both in terms of how you appreciate them, but also in terms of the kind of puzzles that they present and trying to figure them out. Dean Mink, I don't know if you want to say a bit more. Yeah. Uh, um, it's interesting is that uh, every school that you probably visited or every school that you looked at their webpage, and, and we're not different in this sense, will tell you about the importance of critical thinking. 
and our classes are designed to help you be good critical thinkers. And uh, oftentimes they'll talk about developing your writing skills or developing uh, your skills in terms of making presentations. But all of that begins with reading is that if you're not a good reader of text, you're going to kind of struggle at least initially to make that transition to college because we're gonna ask you to read a different way. And, and by that, I mean, we're gonna ask you to be much more interactive with the text that you're reading. And to build on something that Dean Payne said, that's gonna begin with curiosity, is that we want you to kind of read and even to even approach your classes with that kind of openness and curiosity. I, I mean, think about what Emma said. Her, her college career was transformed by a couple of classes that she didn't think was going to necessarily be her path, but it, it kind of became that. Um, and specifically, when you read with curiosity to build on something else Dean Payne said, that is in terms of puzzles. Academic intellectual inquiry is about solving puzzles. When your professors are doing your research, that's what they're doing. They're trying to solve puzzles that they consider to be significant and important. And so when you read, you should try to figure out why is it that they wrote this text? What question are they trying to answer? You wanna be able to try to evaluate the, the evidence or um, the kind of ways in which they try to convince you of the answer, but you should also read with kind of looking for additional or new puzzles or problems. I used to always tell my students, read for the weird. No matter how good a text is, there's going to be something in it that is just weird. It doesn't have an explanation yet. And to be honest, that's where new scholarship comes from. It's not always being able to answer every question, but sometimes it's about being able to formulate a really good question or puzzle that you got from reading someone else's text. Okay, so that is the Dean's Office in a nutshell. Um, it looks like we have a few questions coming in from the audience. So please continue to add questions to the chat as they come up. Uh, but this first one says, as my Dean, are you also my advisor? Deans uh, do provide advice to students, but we work in conjunction with your faculty advisor. So every student will have an assigned faculty advisor, um, and that's a person that, um, you will work closely with. Um, I, ideally, you know, your first is advisor is one with whom you'll have a close relationship because it's also your FSM professor and you'll do course planning for upcoming sessions. Um, you'll talk about major interests and that person will help steer um, the direction of your program. But we work together with them. Uh, and, and one of the things that's, that's interesting or desirable, I think, about our model is, is that Dean Payne and I will work with you for all four years. And the reason that will become important is because we're not your academic advisor, but at some point in time, it's really likely that your academic advisor will change. Your first academic advisor is your FSM instructor. And as I said, those classes are tied to disciplines, but the instruction is often um, kind of pre-disciplinary. At some point in time, you will declare your major and you're going to want a faculty advisor who is an expert in that field. And so the faculty advisor that you choose when you declare your major will be in that particular department, whether it's political science or international relations or women's studies. But Dean Payne and I will work with you for all four years. Okay, so the next question is, are the deans the people who decide if you can apply any AP credit from high school? What is the situation with that? Yes, so students present their uh, original score report to the office of, um, well, the registrar's office or the admissions office, depending on when it comes in. And as we receive your files, we will evaluate and help work through questions about transfer credit. There is good information on the HWS website about what are the scores that weren't credit and then what are the, what are the um, kind of limits of how much uh, transfer credit and AP credit and, and other uh, types of um, pre-college credit opportunities we can review. So we're certainly happy to talk uh, individually with you if you have questions and you can reach out to us, um, but we are the, the initial kind of um, point of contact for you around transfer questions. And generally for AP, you need to have a four or five on the exam and you can transfer in currently up to seven AP credits. 
and uh, and if you are able to transfer in some AP credits, it's always a good thing because it will increase kind of your options going forward uh, in terms of the kind of classes you take at different times. Okay, so our next question is, is there a way to know if a first year seminar has a second class associated with it? Yes, so there should be when the uh, information for the seminars goes live, um, there's information about which seminars have a paired class, as well as information about what that paired class is. And then additionally, there are some uh, first year seminars that are actually uh, living learning communities, where the students within that seminar live on campus uh, close, close to each other within the same residence hall. So that information is available for students to read through as well. But our goal as your deans is that you identify the seminar in which you feel connected to first and then your other, the rest of your experience kind of unfolds from there. Okay, and so this is gonna be our last question for today's session. Um, will the deans maintain good relationships with students after graduation? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm in my second year here, so I, I've not yet had Emma's class will be my first uh, senior cl class who will launch into other aspects of their professional and, and post college lives. But um, we hope to stay in touch with you. We want to see how your journey continues. We want to um, see you at reunion uh, where we certainly are there to, to celebrate um, the uh, alumni uh, uh, participants and, and those who return. So we want to stay connected and that's part of the way that the traditions of the Dean's offices continue to be important in students' lives. Well, and, and for me, that would not only continue, but in some ways that's always been uh, my experience. Like I said, uh, before coming to the Dean's office, uh, I was a professor for a number of years and I can, I can just tell you that one of the really uh, great experiences I had, which was really bizarre when, when I think about it, is that uh, when I used to teach at New College of Florida, uh, one of my students who was my, uh, who ended up being a teaching assistant for me there, she actually got a uh, temporary uh, one-year position here at HWS. And so literally I was teaching across the hall at the exact same time from a, a, a former student of mine. And so just to think of the ways in which Rochelle had changed over the years that she had transformed was really amazing. And it was kind of like, we were constantly laughing at each other because the relationship had fundamentally changed and yet there was no sense in which it wasn't gonna to continue to be a kind of close relationship. I mean, I still am in touch with her and I know she's doing well at her new job. Yeah, and I, I want to echo, I know that for myself and for some of my friends who have graduated in the past couple of years, um, I plan on maintaining a close relationship with the colleges and with uh, both the Hobart and the William Smith deans. And I know that friends of mine have done so as well. Um, the campus community is really one of love and support. Um, but that is all the time we have for today. So thank you all for joining us. If you have any further questions or you'd like to get in touch with any of us later, um, we will add our emails to the chat, uh, but your admissions counselor can always reconnect us as well. Thank you so much, and I hope you all come to campus in the fall. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Look forward to seeing you.